which is to say, let's not, not dealing with any of the points that you're at, accepting them all. At some point, however, what you do have to say in any war situation is, is are people willing to fight it? Are people willing to pay the They're price? They're not willing. Um, They're well, not willing. Yes, I know. We know you know. Right. We know that's your point of view. Now <laughs> we want to hear. We want to hear. Um, we want to hear from the other side. We want to. We're trying to expose a contradiction here. You said we could stop each um, other. <laughs> at any rate. Okay. All right, uh, at good, any all right. rate, Christopher, where does it, where does that bring you? If if you look at this country, at some point, this country says, "Ah, oh, no, enough." What happens, and at what point? That may well be, but that's not the question. It's the question here. Don't you people know anything about a debate? Well, are they, I, I, when you're, I'm not, I, I'm when you're ready, I mean. Um, Excuse me? When, when they're ready or when you are. Well, I am ready, please. Okay, fine. Well, um, it's uh, fallen to me to represent only the style of the um, uh, pallid, uh, epicene, uh, faggy, Anglo-Saxon inhabitants of a rain-sodden archipelago in the North Sea, and obviously you will make the allowance that's necessary to that. But, um, and it, it naturally, therefore, it's with extreme diffidence that I point out to uh, Dr. Benjamin that, um, during the time that Franklin Roosevelt committed the United States Army uh, to war against fascism, African Americans were segregated in the armed forces, and not segregated but equal either. It didn't go to the justice of the war, however. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, um, who at this, I think, uh, in this very hall, uh, called the Union, uh, excuse me, yes, the Union, half slave and half free, of course, a huge presidential exaggeration. It was only about 10% slave, but people do tend to exaggerate in times of crisis. Uh, allowed people in the Union service to pay others to take their place in the armed forces. It led to draft riots in New York in which many black orphanages were burned to the ground. I don't think it goes to the justice of the struggle against slavery, but I'm only trying to make distinctions here and I hope without a, a complete um, absence of success. Now, we were told, I think, I certainly remember being told that this all depended on the United Nations um, and that nothing not warranted by the UN uh, could be just or justifiable. Let's not uh, too hastily dismiss the United Nations in this, but I remind you, um, the United Nations had already accumulated a, a record of about 60 completely flouted and unenforced resolutions concerning not just weapons of mass destruction, but also Iraq's certification that it no longer supported terrorist groups, that it would give a list of the missing people of Kuwait. I'm sorry that Dr. Benjamin views the destruction of Kuwait and Kuwait society with such insouciance. Uh, Kuwait had given hospitality. Don't give a shit about Kuwait. Kuwait had given hospitality to above a quarter of a million. Palestinian refugees, for example, and had allowed them to rebuild their lives in exile in Kuwait in a more exemplary way than almost any other Arab country. It had at least the lineaments of a free press. It did allow women to sit in parliament. I'm sorry if it doesn't meet the exacting conditions of some people, but it was a great deal better than living under the regime of Saddam Hussein. And that was a UN-mandated war, uh, as you will recall, as is the current one. American and British soldiers and others, Danes, Poles, are in Iraq now on a UN mandate passed by a very important resolution which empowers the new and recognizes the new elected government of Iraq and calls on the international community to help with its reconstruction and to protect it from sabotage and, and terrorism in the meantime. I'm sorry to say, and I have to be mild in English about it, I, I fail to see the criminality of that enterprise. I didn't say it was criminal. As a matter of fact, I said just well, the opposite. Didn't. I said, I said, you didn't that say the it was only criminal. reason why, listen, here's what I'm saying. I said, I actually supported uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Gulf uh, uh, Desert Storm because I was opposed to Saddam Hussein invading uh, Kuwait, even though I don't give a damn about the Kuwaitis, is what I'm telling you. I'm saying I oppose it for the same reason I'm opposing America's invasion now of Iraq. Let me just say this, though. Look. I have, I've read Mr. Hitchens' writings uh, before this. I, I must admit, I've not read very many of his books because I'm constantly oppressed by, you know, scholarly texts. Those of you who listen to my radio show know that, you know what I mean? So I'm always reading stuff. And I got so many serious historical texts about things that, you know, I consider more immediate that I have not been able to read. But I've been reading some of his stuff before I came on here. And I came across a piece before the war 
uh, where he uh, was in, written in 2002, where he was already cheering. He, he, in fact, he said that he was certain that Saddam Hussein had uh, nuclear weapons. Let me just say this. I find the whole discussion about whether or not Saddam Hussein had a bomb to be obscene because I once had a top secret security clearance in the Strategic Air Command. Do you know how many bombs the United States got? I mean, really, do you know how, and do you, do you realize that right now, these, these right here, there's some people sitting out there in a mountain, you know, and not only just in a mountain, you can do it from any base because you got the red and the blue phones on every base. A half hour from now, the whole world could be a burnt out uh, 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 radioactive cipher because of the weapons that this country has. Do you know where germ warfare, you know where germs were first weaponized? In Fort Detrick, here. In, 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 so to, to, to listen to this high-minded crap, you know, about the United States, you know, has some right, you know, to say who can have a bomb and who can't. First of all, I didn't give a damn whether Saddam Hussein had a bomb or not. He ain't gonna drop it over here. You better be worried about, listen, I wrote a piece here before the war, go online tomorrow to the black world today and read it. It's called The Iraq Attack, Bush's March of Folly. Now, unlike Mr. Hitchens, who thought the war was a good idea, I thought it was bullshit, and I said so. And not only that, I also, in here, this is a learned treatise, you know, where I show why there couldn't possibly be any relationship between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin forgotten. But the point is this, <laughs> but, but, the point, but the point is this, the point is this is that it's, it, you read it, it reads like prophecy. So y'all need to know something before we go on, since we're gonna all be prognosticating and dropping all kind of esoteric you know, stuff on you. You need to know who the real prophet is. I'm the one who got it right, okay? And if you want me to read it, I'll read it to you. So I brought it prepared to read it, okay? What he said, what I said. Now, the point is, his predictive powers right now are extremely suspect. And not only that, from all I can tell, he's going about faith-based analysis, even though he is, you know, the war in Iraq is a product of a group of crazy theorists who were in a think tank called the Project for a New American Century. And listen, and the only reason, listen, and the only, and I, and I came, I got, all, I got all the documents and shit. I, I could show you step by step how the whole thing happened, starting back in 1997, right? But I ain't gonna be able to do that, I can see that. And let me just say something about language so you all don't think I'm illiterate. Mr. Hitchens, in spite of his constant invective against the British crown, faithfully observes the nuances and rules of the Queen's English all the time. I, however, agree with Mark Twain, uh, Walt Whitman, Tony Morrison, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, and, and Ralph Ellison, that, and Langston Hughes, that the American idiom is more expressive, especially since it has been constantly enriched by the Afro-American uh, idiom. So, so, so I am going to, I will be drifting in and out of the Afro-American idiom at will. Y'all feeling me? <laughs> hey, so I just want y'all to know that. But here's what I'm saying. This war, Mr. Hitchens wrote in one of his pieces here that I have here. Mr. Hitchens wrote that he, he was glad to see.